grab your Bibles this morning and turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 this morning. 1 Corinthians 3, and I'm going to ask you to take a big, deep breath and relax because I'll read a lot of scripture, but we'll only get through as far as we get through today. We'll do this in a couple of parts. We're looking at a message entitled, Christians Behaving Badly. (laughs) That's what Paul's concerned about to the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, he said to them, I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. For you are still carnal. For where there is envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behave like mere men? For when one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters, but, God who, but it's God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. And let let each one of you take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation, watch this, everybody, you're involved in this somewhere here, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw. Each one's works will become clear for the day, that's the day of judgment, will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he has built on, endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Wow. Paul is talking about the Corinthian believers and their great carnality as he rebukes them. And yet at the same time, because he's a loving pastor, he rebukes them and turns right around and exhorts them. That is, he brings into their mind, into their memory, the ultimate day that's coming for the believer. That we will all as Christians stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. What's amazing is Paul is already right now starting to set them up in their thinking, for something that is very, very well known to them. I told you before, this is the church at Corinth, Greece. I've told you before in the introduction that it is in Corinth that archaeological discovery has unearthed the Bema seat of the great Olympics of Greece. Bema, B-E-M-A. The word Bema in Greek means the reward platform. We've all seen the Olympics, and we've seen the, the gold and the silver and the bronze award, right? Each one is a winner. They all three win, but there is the one person, and I love that. Think about each or all three have won, but based upon diligence and faithfulness, one person is distinguished more than the other in achievement. They're all winners, and that was the Greek thinking, is that they should all three of them be recognized as champions, but when you define it down to Each one's ability, listen church, and gifting, which one was the most faithful to the call that was given to them? So in this room this morning, you may be a silver medalist, a gold medalist, you might be a bronze medalist. Here's the point. You are to be one who gets a medal. (laughs) That should be the striving passion of the believer is that we are going to serve Christ in this great spiritual endeavor that we would please him. And so as someone went up to the Bema seat, the reward seat, notice this is not the same word that is used in Revelation 20 for the judgment seat of God. You guys, listen, you will not, if you're a Christian, you will not appear before the great white throne judgment. All those who are lost, who never came to Christ, 
no matter how bad or how good they were morally, if they died without Jesus, they will stand before God in, book, in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verse 11, the great white throne judgment. They're all condemned, the Bible says there. But the Bema seat is altogether different. If you're a Christian, you will appear before the Bema seat of Christ. And you are going to receive a champion's reward based upon your faithfulness as Christians. And so I don't know what you think about this. Um, people have their opinions about it. Uh, but when you think about church, when you think about spiritual things, um, Paul is really talking about many at Corinth as being what I would say today, knockoff Christians. And I don't know what you think about knockoff things. I think knockoff things are a real bummer. You know, knockoff watches. Have you ever been to Mexico and bought a, a Rolex for 25 bucks? <laughs> and then by the time the sun sets, the fingers or the hands have fallen off of the watch? Have you ever gone to the uh, Swamp Meet or Fairgrounds and bought a $15 pair of Maui Gym sunglasses? <laughs> and then by the time, you know, the sun goes down, the, the pieces have fallen apart on it. They're knockoffs. Or you see, you know, uh, at the fair or wherever, these Gucci purses for $9.99. <laughs> Something's wrong. <laughs> when somebody says, I'm a Christian and their life doesn't back it up, something's wrong. They're a knockoff. Now what Paul, I got to tell you, I got to be very careful how I bring this message across because some of you are not going to like it. How do I know? Because I don't like parts of it. And here's the reason why. Paul has been speaking to us about the spiritual man, we looked at that last week, and the unbeliever, the natural man. We've all studied that. There's the natural man who doesn't know God, and there's the spiritual man who does know God. And in between is this person called the carnal Christian. And we don't want to even begin to think that there could be such a thing as a carnal Christian. How can you know the eternal, true, living God and have salvation and not walk with him and, and be effective? And yet, it is true. There are people who are going to heaven, but their lives have never affected anybody for good. In fact, the carnal Christian has been a Christian that has been behaving badly in life. And it seems like an oxymoron. It seems like something that you can't bring together. It seems like water and oil. But it is true nonetheless. As Christians, we belong, if you like it or not, my friend, as a Christian, you belong to a community of believers. God has engineered it this way. I'm going to be real straight to you as a pastor to your heart. If you are the type of person that just floats around from church to church and you never get into the family matters of a local fellowship, the Bible would say that you're a carnal Christian. You never get into the family affair of being a committed believer to a local family of believers. As a Christian, we are to belong to a local church. That's why Jesus himself, Paul the Apostle, John, James, Peter, they all made mention and reference of the fact, and again, as I mentioned a second ago, Jesus in the book of Revelation says that he wrote seven letters to the seven churches, didn't he? And each of them were a specific city in Asia Minor called Turkey today, and Jesus speaks to a local fellowship of believers. We did a long series here in this church, about what Jesus would say to the church. What's he saying to Calvary Chapel Chino Hills this morning? Whatever he's saying, he's saying to those that make up this local body of believers. And listen, keep this in mind as we get into this study. There is not some super church on one side of the street and some lesser church down the street. There is not some of this church and some of that church. That's carnal. That's wrong. But there are local churches. And you say, yeah, but Pastor Jack, some of them are only uh, a riverbed away from one another. That's ordained by God. That's God's business. And we are not to criticize and we are not to critique what God might be doing somewhere else. Now, granted, we are to judge according to the word of God. Is a local church teaching the word of God? That is the criteria. If you're visiting this morning, that's how you are to judge this fellowship. Does it exalt the word of God, the Bible? Is the Bible the foundation of this church? Is Jesus Christ the foundation that they've laid? It's not the 
the seating, it's not the carpet, it's not the windows, it's not the parking. It's none of that stuff. Those are things that do not matter. To the believer who wants to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, the truth is this, that they are hungering for the word of God and they have found a local church that challenges them, feeds them, instructs them, builds them up, and yes, is used by God to exhort. That is to even, at times, to convict And so Paul is speaking, and his whole passion is to get this church healthy and on its way. So church, mark it down if you would. We'll look at our first point regarding Christians behaving badly. It's found in verses 1 and 2, and it's this, that they just won't grow up. That's the reason why they're behaving badly. They just won't grow up. They are people in the body of Christ, in the church, but they just don't grow up. They won't grow up. And why is that? It's because of this, verse 1, because they won't eat what they should. They don't eat good food. It's not that good food's presented or not presented. It's just that they don't eat of it. They're not partaking of it. Look at verse 1. Paul says, I, brethren, he's speaking to brothers and sisters in Christ, could not speak to you. See that? He's talking to Christians. As to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. So the carnal Christian is a person that's very, very weak and having a grip on the word of God. Paul says, I'd love to talk to you about deeper things, but I cannot. You've had a conversion experience. You've raised your hand. You went forward at the crusade or at church, or you prayed that prayer, and you had a life change. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You believe that he rose again. Are you listening? You're so quiet. You believe he rose from the grave. You believe that he's the son of God. You believe that he's coming back. And uh, you believe that the Bible is, in fact, the word of God. But outside of that, you are very, very much what we would call a recreational type Christian. It all depends on who you're with at any given time that you let your light so shine. And this is critical. Why does that happen in our lives? Why do we faint in the moment of criticism or opposition or the moment the world comes against us and we, at some moment, leave behind our Christian commitment? It is beca- it's because we have refused to eat the right kind of food. And that, that food, the empowerment, is the Word of God. Paul says, I want to talk to you about the Word of God deeper, but I can't do that. He says, why? He says, well, first of all, you're not spiritual. I, I want to talk to you, but you're not spiritual. You are, in fact, carnal. The word carnal, listen to this. The word carnal is the word in the Greek for sarx. So who what? Who cares? Have you ever heard of sarcophagus? Sarx is flesh. Sarcophagus is flesh. Sarcophagus, flesh eater. That's what a sarcophagus is. Flesh eater. Something that eats the flesh. Carnal is to respond to the flesh, to be obedient to the flesh, to be uh, subservient to the flesh. Sarks, carnal, uh, the, the Christian who's been born again is yet now still has its loyalties to the flesh, the demands of the flesh. Paul says, I can't talk to you about spiritually deep things because your brain, your heart, your lifestyle won't even go deeper with me. You guys, I hate to tell you this, but it's absolutely true. The reason why we have trials and difficulties in life as a Christian, if you and I knew the true glory that is in a trial, we'd actually sign up for them. You know how we, let's be honest, you know how we do everything to avoid them? The sooner we figure out that we cannot get in trouble when we follow God. When we follow God, we follow God. And when we follow God, we wind up being in places that he's ordained. And thereby, you cannot be in trouble when you follow him. You say, well, what if somebody throws rocks at me? Hey, first of all, they're throwing rocks at God if you followed him. Okay, at, at some point, you're going to duck, and it's going to hit the Lord right in the robe or somewhere, and, that, and the Lord's going to come to your defense. You follow God, you don't have to worry about it. And let me tell you, be encouraged. The more you follow God, the more you're going to be criticized. The more you're going to be attacked. The more you're going to be mocked. The more you're going to be fill in the blank. The great thing is to be on God's side as you follow him. And so Paul is saying, I want you to be spiritual, but you're not. You're in fact carnal. You're fleshly. But why is that the case? Because they are caught up in the flesh, and the word means to have a fleshly existence. Their affection, the word means that their affections are divided. They have a divided heart. Imagine in a relationship, 
a husband and a wife. And that husband or that wife has divided affections for someone else. That is horrific. It's terrifying. It's wrong. But the truth of the matter is, my friend, the Bible tells us, for example, that God wants us to be advancing. He doesn't want us to go back to Egypt, as was the case with the children of Israel. And for us today, listen, you need to ask yourself, are you going back to Egypt in your Christian walk? Are you no longer advancing? Paul is saying, you may very well be carnal. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 3, he says there, 2 Timothy 2, 3, he says, you therefore must endure hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Can you imagine somebody going into battle and he's got his flat screen TV with him as he heads into some battle zone? Can you imagine some guy going into a war theater and he's pulling behind him a wagon full of his Xbox and, and, and uh, you know, NASCAR models or whatever he's got? I don't know what he's got, but you don't take your toys to battle. And you don't drag your private life, Paul is saying, into the things that God's enlisted you into. God becomes so prominent in your life that you understand, I'm a Christian soldier, as it were, in the spiritual warfare of this battle, and I'm going to let God dictate what's value, valuable in my life. Very, very important. So listen, the the thing is that we suffer when we do not eat what we should be eating. And that is the word of God should be eaten up in our lives. A couple Wednesday nights ago, actually maybe like a month ago now, I gave a challenge to the Wednesday nighters to read slowly over the course of 30 days the book of Philippians. I challenged the Wednesday night group to get up one hour early in their mornings before they start their day and to read the book of Philippians and to see what happens in 30 days. And I've been hearing people tell me what's happening to their lives over the last 30 days already. They're not even, I think, completed the 30 days. God's word is radicalizing their life to the glory of God. They are excited. They're getting answers to their prayer life, they're telling me. They've seen God reward them for their commitment to him. Secondly, under this point, it's not that they just wouldn't eat what they should be eating. They won't grow up because they don't have a very good diet. They choose to eat junk. They're babes in Christ. They're stunted. The word means that their development has been retarded. He says, I fed you with milk, and milk's great for a season, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. (laughs) The word receive it, uh, they spit it up. And even now you're still not able. You're still spitting it up. So first of all, mark this down, Bible student. It's kind of fun to know this. What is the milk that Paul is referring to, and what's the meat? Well, it's understood this way, that the milk is the doctrinal things of the earthly ministry of Jesus. I gave you milk. Listen, Christian. If you're a Christian this morning... The doctrinal milk of the ministry of Jesus Christ and his earthly ministry are things that should be extremely well known to you. Hang on to your seat. Listen carefully. Do you name the name of Jesus? Do you say you know him? If the answer to that is yes, then you ought to be able to lead someone else to Christ. You should know how to do that. That's why we have the call ministry here to teach you how to do that. If you are the most fresh new believer you ought to know the difference between heaven and hell and how to get there you should know the difference as to how is a person saved based upon what does god save a man or a person or how these are fundamental things do you know that there are fundamental truths to being a christian that if you don't know you're not really a christian there are fundamental truths Do you know how and do you know why Jesus had to be virgin born? That Mary had to be a virgin. The Old Testament demands it. Why? These are basic things. Did you know that you must be baptized into the body of Christ? I didn't say water. That's a step of obedience and that's a beautiful thing. But how does a person get baptized into the body of Christ? You should know the difference. When does that happen? These are fundamental things that are basic to Christianity. That's the milk. John 3.16, that's milk, basic. What's the meat? The meat is the practical doctrines of life. What does that mean? The meat is this. 
um, I'm having uh, anger thoughts. Where do I go in the Bible to find that? I need to get a decision from God about my job. I need to know where to go in the Bible to find the instruction on that. When somebody comes and, and shares something with you, you turn to the Bible and you give them the answer. Everything, listen, Christian, everything that you and I do, there should be a biblical dialogue going on with one another. That is the spiritual man. That is the person. When we get together and talk, we dialogue. If Kevin and I are going to talk, this should be a dialogue based upon Scripture. If James and I are going to talk, it should be based upon Scripture. These are the things that are the meat of the word. It, it's what surrounds our lives. That's the spiritual man. Do you lean to the Bible? Do you find yourself leaning on the Bible more and more? You are a spiritual man or woman. But are you being led by your emotions? You know, you, you know Jesus died on the cross for your sins, but your emotions dictate your life. More on that in a moment. But the diet is not very good that the person's consuming. In a nutshell, not much Bible time. A lot of news time, a lot of Oprah time, a lot of um, uh, sitcom time, a lot of radio time, no Bible time. The Bible said, Paul is telling us in these words, that we are in fact carnal. 1 Peter 2, 1 says, therefore, laying aside all malice. This is a great word. It sounds so nice, laying aside malice. He says, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, evil speaking, laying it aside. The word means to throw it away from you. You ever seen somebody driving down? This drives me crazy. You ever been driving down the highway and somebody throws trash out their car? Does that drive you crazy or is it me? Oh, I want to be a police officer so bad at that moment. And I have my James Bond pictures in my mind of my grill of my car opening up and machine gun fire coming out of the grill because the guy throws his Burger King bag out the window. Oh! But in a spiritual way, that's what that word means. Take the junk and throw it out. As Christians, that's, that's how the spiritual man walks. Grabbing the junk that we assimilate in this life and we throw it out. Get rid of it. He says in 1 Peter 2, 1, Therefore laying aside all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Isn't that a great word? When a baby's born and we got a, a brand new granddaughter, what, is, what does she want? She wants milk. But let me tell you something. She's getting to that zone now where the doctor is saying, I think she's, about, she's getting ready soon to get whatever they get next. You know, green beans or <laughs> carrots or eggplant. I don't know what's in those bars. And you've you got to get the camera going when this happens because they're so used to the milk, they're accustomed to the milk, and then you bring in the first scoop of carrots and you've got to have the camera rolling because the expressions on the face is, What? It's got to be introduced. As a Christian, you need to be growing day by day and eating greater types of food for strength and for development. And if you don't keep feeding that child in the levels of its growth, they will become anemic. They will have bad bone development. Their eyesight will not improve. You will starve this child in a lot of ways. The same is true about spiritual things. Have you been a Christian for 10 years, but you're still drinking milk? I got news for you. You have a spiritual bone decay. You have atrophy. But can you say in 10 years you have grown stronger and deeper in the things of God? Your diet is good. The carnal Christian's diet is not good. Hebrews 5.12 says this, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you. Again, the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use <laughs> have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. This is great. Okay, you guys, I'm pushing 53 and here's the deal. Uh, my bones are hurting. So A, I can choose to eat Advil for breakfast. I'll have two Advils and a slice of bacon, please. Or, and this is what I've been doing lately, it's painful, but it's great, 
is to get out and start walking and jogging. My doctor says, walk and jog. Don't, don't just jog. That'll kill you. Just walk and jog. Walk and jog. Walk and jog. Why? I said, look, I can understand the walk part, but what's the jog part? He said, the jog part you got to have. The jog part of, the, of your body hitting the pavement strengthens your bones and the flow of nutrients in your bones as you get older. Jump rope, run, jog, do something. But get, he said, uh, a little bit of violence going on and shock to your bones. Isn't it interesting that the Bible says the spiritual person can only grow if you get out there and exercise yourself in the things of a life developing with God. What does that mean? It means you sign up for GMO. I'm not joking. I don't know what some of you might be thinking when we say sign up for GMO, sign up to be an usher, sign up to be children's ministry, sign up for a discipleship class, sign up for a ministry. What, what? You might, if you're carnal, you're sitting on the other side of this podium and you're thinking, they just want me to do stuff here. You don't understand. It's going to get done with or without you. Do you think the kingdom of God will not function without you? Here's the most tragic thing in the universe for me. God will just step over you and find someone else. I don't know about you, but I don't like being left behind in anything. I don't even like being late. I'm afraid I might miss something. The reason why we offer so many ministries for you to get involved in is because maybe one of those you'll step up to and jump into. And guess what? You're going to have to pray. You're going to have to meet people you don't like. You say, can you say that in a church? Oh, trust me. You'll meet people you don't like. And here's the fun part. You got to love them because they're your brother or sister. <laughs> Pastor, how do I love them when I don't even like them? That's Christianity. <laughs> oh, God, give me love for this brother. That's real living, my friend. That is real discipleship. A carnal Christian sits back and is very skilled at the remote, knows every channel on their programming but can't find one verse in the Bible. Can't c- contribute to anyone's spiritual welfare. And so you get involved in ministry. There's no excuse. I, I hope it doesn't happen at this church, but imagine the day when we stand in judgment before the Lord Jesus and uh, you might be thinking hypothetically, I don't think we'll say anything like this at the moment, but um, can you imagine when Jesus says, okay, what'd you do for me? What'd you do for me? I don't care about anything you've ever done in your past. I died on the cross for that. That's forgotten. But now that you're saved, what'd you do for me? I want to know what'd you do. Well, you know, I thought about a lot of stuff to do. <laughs> Listen, this won't even fly. I prayed about so many things. Christians sometimes have the biggest cop-out statement in the universe. I'm going to pray about that. I wish we had the Pinocchio syndrome. As Christians, you know, I'm going to pray about that. Boop. Uh, I'm really going to pray hard about that. Boop. The nose just grows. I'm not going to pray about it. You're ditching class. Look, there's a person over there on the street corner hungry. You know, I'm going to pray about helping that person. That's a disgrace. There's so many things that we can be involved in. Where does that come from? From you eating the word of God. The Bible goes out, it gets into your heart, it changes your life. Also this, they just won't grow up because they can't keep things down. Paul says they keep spitting stuff up. He says even now you're still not able to even handle the milk. You, can, you certainly can't handle the meat. It just comes up. You're not even to re- able to receive it. The word means that you still can't receive it. You weren't able, you're not. The word also implies that you can't digest anything that is of value. They couldn't keep it down. Think about what they cannot keep down. I went through the Bible, found out some things about how the word is communicated as food. The bread, they can't keep it down. The honey of God's word, they can't keep down. The meat of God's word, they can't keep down. Colossians 3.14 says, But above all these things, put on love. A carnal Christian is not interested in loving people unless they'll be the star recipient of their act of so-called love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. A carnal Christian has no peace. 
to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. A carnal Christian complains about everything. And let the word of Christ dwell in you, what's the word? Richly. It means that it's got a grip of your fiber of who you are, the Bible. You eat, sleep, drink, talk, think, Bible. You say, Pastor, man, that sounds like legalism to me. That's carnal to think like that. It, it is. They just won't grow up. Point number two is found in verse three. And that is Christians behaving badly is this, that they won't play nice. They just don't play nice. Why? Because their emotions get the best of them. You ever seen kids playing? And, they're, and, the, and the kid is just emotionally uh, fixated on self. They don't play nice. They can't share a thing. Somebody brings out something. That's mine. The kid grabs it. <laughs> and then somebody else brings it. That, and the kid grabs it. He just keeps grabbing everything, pulls it to himself. He's got 400 toys around him when his neighbor kid sitting next to him has got nothing. Man, I tell you, if that's going on in your child's life, you better start teaching them to share now before it's too late. Man, because when they grow up, you know what they do? They grow up into a world like we live in right now, and they, they it, 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 I'm stuttering right now because I, I assume if they move out of your house, I'm saying, how do I say this when they get old? 26 years old now, right? Healthcare program covers a kid. A kid who's 26. A child, 26. A child, 26. A 20. Can you imagine? You want to talk about carnal? In a... In a a culture that's raised up and it's happening in the church. It's happening in, in a God context. A person grows up like this. Give it to me. Give it to me. Take out the trash. No. You give it to me and then I might take out the trash. Think about that. 26-year-old man still living at home. The government says, yeah, you got to pay for his health care. Mm. No. You say, Jack, what does that have to do with anything? Think of this. A Christian. A Christian walking around. Full-grown Christian person. Complaining, whining, griping, contributing nothing to the family of God, even though God has done everything for them, it's all self centered. Those are my toys. It's my world. It's all about me. I want this. How come you guys, I'm not coming back. Oh, I wish I could share with you guys my email I get. The emails I get is amazing stuff. Did you ever think about the sanctuary? It's too, it's too much bland. The walls are kind of beige. The seats are beige and the carpet's beige. It's just too much. People come to church. Where? There's a lot of glass but no stained window. What do you do with that? I got a phone call last week from a guy who was all upset uh, out, of, out, of, out of the area listening to the radio program. Completely misunderstood the, the whole program. He's not a Christian. But it's like, man. And the Lord says, Jack, don't go carnal on me now. <laughs> Bear up with them. Yes, but there's some people in the church that won't play nice because their emotions get in the way. He says in verse 3, for you are still carnal. Paul's lamenting this. You're not growing up. Well, how do we know if they're carnal? There's envy. Look, there's envy among you. He says, are you not behaving like men, behaving badly? Envy. You're still carnal because... Envy, the word is a very powerful one. It means this, your heart is inflamed, indignation. We get the word jealousy from this, having a passion to put down someone else. Envy, to have a passion to overcome someone, to be at war. The word means to be at war with another person in one's heart or mind. To, we get the word seethe, to seethe, envy. Paul says you're carnal. And you're not an effective Christian because you're envious. And this word walk or behave, behaving or walking badly, the word means that they go all around. The word means to traffic about, to go all around, to distill or to dis, uh, deposit a wake of envy. That's a strong word. Boy, I tell you, Paul's laying it on the church, huh? The Holy Spirit's laying it on us. 
In 1 John, the Bible there tells us in 1 John chapter 1, if we say that we have fellowship with him, God, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Notice the criteria. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. He goes on in 1 John chapter 2. He who says, I know God and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. He who says he abides in him ought also to walk just as Jesus walked. Strong words. That's Christianity. And Paul is laying it on them. Dr. Ironside says this. Dr. H.A. Ironside, great Bible commentator of yesteryear. And I quote, The carnal Christian is a man whose life is characterized by emotions, which lead him from one performance to another. He is a gifted critic, And it's quick to point out the faults of others. But in his own life, listen to this, but in his own life, he has learned to tolerate and allow and excuse his own sinful actions. Rather than living for one victory to another, his life is a perpetual state of sin and confession. He is carnal, backslidden. He is, in fact, unclean. Strong words. Also this, they just won't play nice this way, church. Look at verse 3 continues, because their selfishness defines them. A carnal Christian would be selfish. Are you still carnal? He goes on to say, for there is strife among you. Strife. His selfishness defines him. This is very sad. Strife means to quarrel, to be contentious. It means to have the need. Are you guys still with me? We're almost done. We're almost out of time. It's not that we're done. We're almost out of time. They have the need to debate. The Christian, the carnal Christian, lives among spiritual Christians. Well, how do you know? How can you find them? They're always striving in the, listen, in the middle of an argument. You will find them where the drama is. Do you know people who are Christians, but always there is a controversy? They're always in the middle of a disruption. They're carnal. The Bible says, not spiritual. Proverbs 6, verse 14 says, perversity is in their heart. He devises evil continually. And how do you know? It says he sows discord among the brethren. The word discord among the brethren is to infuse trouble, to divide people, to cause breakups. Interesting. The spiritual Christian works at unifying believers. The carnal Christian works in separating believers. G. Campbell Morgan writes, beware of them. He's disgruntled. And they're perfect pictures of a spiritual cancer. Ephesians 4, 3 says that the spiritual man, you and I, are to be endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Church, listen, that means that you and I, what you and I think, believe, and have to say, if it's outside the Word of God, it's not that important, you guys. But the carnal Christian's opinion is paramount to everything. The carnal Christian's got to win the argument. The carnal Christian's got to finish on top. The carnal Christian's fish is always bigger. When you say, you know what, it was so great. Three people accepted the Lord yesterday and it was so wonderful. Oh yeah, well you know what, I was at this thing and seven people accepted the Lord. They're carnal. Their show's always got to be bigger. It's always got to be brighter. It's always got to be whatever. They're carnal. Why do they say things like that? They're insecure. In fact, I'll read a a quote to you that's probably going to have to wait until next week, but I'll paraphrase it right now. Because of their insecurity and the fact that they've lost or never had a full understanding of their position in Jesus Christ, they have to create a world around them. And yet they're on their way to heaven. And they shouldn't be like that. There's no need for it. There's no need. Years ago, I'll never forget this picture. Years ago, in Orange County, there used to be something called like the African Safari thing down by Orange County. Remember the Orange County drag strip by El Toro Air Base? All that stuff used to be there. 
And I saw one of the saddest things. Now, granted, it was a recovery center there at that zoo place, whatever it was, the African wildlife thing. And there were turkeys walking around in a pen. And I'm sure there was a good reason for this. I, I don't know the reason why. It just looks so sad. You know what else was walking around in the pen on the ground with the turkeys? Was a massive uh, golden eagle. A golden eagle. You ever seen how big a golden eagle is? They're scary big. And these, I'm sorry, but I know it was almost our, our national bird. Did you know the turkey was almost our national bird? <laughs> Benjamin Franklin. I, Benjamin Franklin was an awesome guy. I love him. But he wanted the turkey to be the national symbol. <laughs> because it sustained the pilgrims and it preserved. Anyway. I'm glad his vote didn't count that day. <laughs> but let's be honest. Isn't a turkey just as ugly as sin? <laughs> and walking around there is this golden eagle. Majestic, awesome, but I pitied that bird. I looked at him and I'm thinking, man, don't you know, dude, your claws could rip that turkey right in half. You don't even know it. Your, your incredible hook beak and, dude, the turkey's eyes are on the side of his head because he's a, he's a bird of, of uh, prey. I mean, not a bird of prey. He's preyed upon. What is he? He's a disposable bird. <laughs> That's the word. Predatory birds have eyes in front of their face. They have a face. Predatory birds have a face. That's why a pigeon, you know a pigeon has to put his head forward and then walk underneath his body? <laughs> Did you know that? Because his eyes are on the side of his head. No, I'm not joking. An eagle, can, an eagle can just walk. I'm making a point here. Come on, stay with me, focus. What in the world is an eagle doing on the ground walking with turkeys? Why would a Christian who's born again, whose name is written down in heaven, walk around with a bunch of turkeys in this world? He walks among those he ought not to be walking with. You are saved, man. Get up and live like it. You're going to heaven. Start practicing heaven in your life. Don't walk, well, you know what? All my friends are a bunch of beer drinking, pot smoking, uh, you know, loser. And that's, you know, that's where I'm at. You're an eagle going. <laughs> Come on, man. Get out of there. Get out of there and walk like you're supposed to walk. And finally, i got about three minutes left. We'll do this. They just won't play nice because their jealousies surround them. Their jealousies surround them. But you are still carnal. Why? Because there's divisions among you. Divisions. The word means this in Greek, that they've dislocated themselves and people. Where they go is a bunch of dislocated people. They leave them in their wake or they gather them together. They're dislocated. The word means to be disconnected, to be divided. It means to be cut off from the rest. They surround themselves because of their jealousies. 1 Corinthians 12, 25 says, So that there should be no divisions in the body, that is of the church, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. What does that mean? It means that the carnal Christian cannot handle someone else being recognized. <laughs> the car let's okay, let's let's say you're you're being honored or the church is being honored. If the church is being honored, then a carnal church that's somewhere else would say, Oh, well, you know what? The reason why is because. Or if you're the the spiritual Christian being honored, God's blessing your life. Oh, you know what? The carnal Christian says, it's probably because they've always got a bullet in their gun. And they're, and they're going to heaven. Don't you wish they wouldn't or couldn't? Lisa and I joke around sometimes. I'll tell you this. Stuff going on. Crazy stuff and life stuff and, you know, this person and I can't and, and he doesn't like me and the phone calls and Lisa's, last night Lisa gets a phone call, 11, 11 o'clock last night uh, from some other part of the nation actually, uh, counseling, spiritual matter, blah, 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 this stuff and that and, and uh, we often say privately among ourselves, man, things are so messed up, this person, they're divorcing their wife and this person, uh, 
did this and that person, man, you know. And then the, th- the thought comes out of her, I mean, we say, man, if you were Jesus, would you come back for this? <laughs> you think about, if you were Jesus, would you come back to pick this up? Being the church, it's so dysfunctional. And you think about it, if Jesus is going to come back based upon our performance, he ain't coming back. <laughs> I know He's not coming back. He's coming back because he's faithful. And my friend, listen. They can't grow up and they won't play nice because their jealousy surround them. There are people who, according to Romans 12, 10, they cannot be kindly affectionate one to another. There's no brotherly love in them. And they cannot give preference and honor to another. A carnal Christian tears people down. So you guys, I know this wasn't, was not a happy, feel-good message this morning. And it's so, it's so much of a bummer. We'll pick up part two next week together. <laughs> but I got to tell you, this is like going to a doctor. Okay? When the doctor says, this is going to be a little uncomfortable. Just know he's lying his full head off. When your doctor says it's going to be a little uncomfortable, you better bite your finger and hang on because it's going to hurt. And Paul is saying, listen. Is there any consolation to all of this? You're a Christian. You're going to heaven. Listen to the beauty of this, what he's saying. Okay, carnal Christian, you're going to heaven. When you die, you're going to heaven. But I have to warn you, the spiritual believer has been building upon gold and silver and precious stones in their life. You, carnal Christian, you've been building upon wood, hay, and straw. And we're all going to stand before the Lord someday, and he's going to turn on the oven. And whatever makes it through the oven determines how much glory you give back to God in eternity. I've literally, we're all done. You can close your Bibles. I have literally heard people tell me regarding the verses that we're looking at. And they think think they're so spiritual by saying this. Pastor, I... I don't want to have any rewards in heaven because I don't want to take away from any of the glory from the Lord. Listen, I don't know what kind of drug you take to think like that. But you've missed it. Listen, here's why. Here's why you want to be the most faithful, radicalized Christian on the planet, the most loving, biblical, wild man for Jesus. Here's the reason why. Here's the reason why. Everything that you and I do in this world for him, in the end, read the Bible carefully, we will get a reward for in the day of judgment. If I stopped right there, you'd say, well, I'm just going to be happy to be there. I understand that, but I'm not finished. You're given a reward in heaven for your faithfulness in this life. Then the book of Revelation tells us that we walk away from that moment We go over before Jesus, and what do we do? We cast down our rewards before him at his feet. And we give it back to him. So I don't know about you, but I want to have wheelbarrows. Listen, I want to have, I want to have truckloads. I want to, beep, 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 beep. Bring it in. Why? When we dump it before the feet of the Lord, I want him to get all the glory. And listen, you guys, it's not, it's those works don't get us into heaven. No, you see, because we are saved, we want to produce those good works. Because in the end, it will glorify him the more. And the carnal Christian can't handle that. Because they're the ones that are, when the, when the beep, beep, beep goes off, they're going to get run over by the truck. Because God says, I'll share my glory with no one. Capiche? Next Sunday, we'll pick it up together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your words. Mm. Lord, we ask you, Father, that even right now as we just sit here and get ready to go out into this world, Father, that this exhortation from you would cause us this morning to say and to agree that we need the refilling, the baptism, the indwelling power now afresh of your Holy Spirit in our lives. 
We ask you, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would come upon us, Lord, and galvanize us to this world. Galvanize us, Father, to the call. Galvanize us, Lord, to the task. Father, that we would use every resource. It's amazing, Lord, just how the other day we looked at cell phone technology as the word of God is going out. And just how we got to watch 300,000 numbers light up as people around the world were searching out the gospel on their phone. And then, Lord, we think of GMO, the Global Media Outreach Opportunity to Become an Online Missionary. Everything we have, our computer, our phones, our feet, our mouths, our tools to share the love of God to the world. Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to the cross for us. Thank you for his death in our place to set us free. Thank you, Lord, for having him be risen from the dead that the grave will never have, ever, ever have any victory over us. We will never see spiritual death. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Church, listen, as we end right now in this closing song, let's all stand. But if today you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if today the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you and your motive has been wrong for why you are a Christian, then there'll be men and women, pastors and prayer elders up front here to pray with you right now and to reintroduce you or to introduce you to the walk of God. God bless you as we close out in the song of worship. We'll see you Wednesday night.